Hey you guys, it's Peter, and welcome to my channel, Peterisms, where I tell stories of my life and just little things that I have learned as I have grown into the person that I am today. And little Boo Radley is, he just went, mmm, little dog. Little Boo Radley, you wanna be in the video with me? Come here, sweetheart. He has been following me around and helping me make videos today, and he's been running around outside having adventures. Have you been having so many adventures today? You have, hi honey, you have, so he's gonna help me make this video today. Are you ready? All right, so today I only brought two books with me. I brought the Melody Beatty books with me and I thought we would just dive right in to my favorite meditation book of life and that is The Language of Letting Go by Melody Beatty. Um, I think I was talking about this maybe on my vlog the other day. I was. That's how he gets his little space going on. Um, I was saying that if you buy the book Codependent No More, which next to my recovery literature, and sometimes I even feel like it's it profoundly changed me more, um, the Codependent No More, because it, it, it was just this book that taught me so much about my life. And really, like if, you, if you've read the book, the beginning of it is stories mostly about spouses, women, um, wives, married to their alcoholic husbands and how they tried to control that behavior. And so it's them telling their stories and then it goes in and it starts talking about codependency. But for anybody out there that has had toxic relationships in their life or the inability to set boundaries and limits or trying to control other people, whether that's siblings or spouses or parents or coworkers or just even friends, you know, that like you get into a situation and you just like, things don't go the way that you want them to and, and you, you, you know, you define your worth through the eyes of somebody else sometimes. Like, I think the book Could Have Been In A More is so valuable and it really, really helped me and it, it really helped me to learn how to set limits and boundaries for people because one of the reasons, and I think we don't talk much about this, one of the reasons why it was so hard for me to set limits and boundaries, and, and I think, also, I'm kind of like starting to peel the onion back on this, and it's like, I, I, maybe I won't even read a meditation today. But I think what I was going to say is that one of the reasons why it is so t hard to set limits and boundaries for people is because we don't even know what that means. You know, we don't even know when, I, I think like when that concept was first introduced to me, I didn't even know what that meant. Like, well, how do I set a limit with somebody? I mean, I literally visually saw it as like drawing a line in the sand kind of thing, you know? And so I didn't really get it. And then I think the other thing that is hard about it is we don't teach people how to do that, okay? But for me, the biggest issue for setting limits and boundaries that we don't talk about has always been that when I, okay, am feeling hurt in a relationship, or I feel like the other person, or their life, or their behavior, or whoever they are, or whatever, is toxic to me, and I don't feel like I'm enjoying that relationship anymore, or I am not getting what I need out of that relationship, or I'm giving so much and I'm not getting anything in return. We've all been through these kind of relationships, right? Where you know, like, you need to set a solid boundary, okay? And by boundaries, what that could be is you don't take somebody's phone calls after a certain time. You don't need, you don't have to tell the other person what the boundary is either. That's the one thing, right? Like you just have those boundaries with yourself. And boundaries and setting limits are very similar to me on some level. But you know, it could be you don't take that person's phone calls after a certain time because you know that they're gonna be drunk. Or you know that it's just gonna be, they always call after a certain time or you know, like with a lot of like boyfriends, girlfriends, maybe he only ever calls after 11 o'clock because he wants to, you know, <laughs> get romantical or something, right? And so you feel used. Um, or maybe it's that you set a limit like, you know, that, um, you know, like I'm thinking a lot about romantic relationships right now. I don't know why I'm thinking of things that my friends have told me, but you know, like where you're only invited to some things and not to others. Okay. Well, it's like, well, if I'm not invited to the family stuff then I don't want to go to the friends, you know what I mean? Like, um, I think with family members, it's like, I'm not, I think a big one, you know, has always been for me. Well, not with family members really, but with people in my life, I'm not gonna be spoken to that way. You know, I have, I really have been very blessed in my life as far as family to not have to set like really strict limits and boundaries with people. I really have. I mean, there's been a few times that I have felt like I had. And when I was younger and I got sober, I think with my mom and early sobriety, I had to. and. 
But like when I was in high school and stuff, with my mom being an active alcoholic, I didn't know how to set a limit or a boundary. You know, I had no clue. I didn't know what that meant. And I didn't, I wasn't healthy enough at that time to do it. But what I was gonna say, and I keep on like going over my words and not saying it is, the one reason why I think at times I don't set limits and boundaries with friends, you know, that I've had in the past, is because I didn't want to hurt their feelings. And I was like, well, I don't want to just exit their life. And I don't want to not, you know, have this person be like, I don't know what happened, like, whatever. And so I would tell them, I would say, like, you know, like, Every time I talk to you, you're negative or you're miserable or, you know, like, it just, I, I don't feel like you're there for me in the ways that I'm there for you. And this relationship is starting to feel toxic to me and parasitic. And it was like it would go in one ear out the other. It was like they didn't hear it, you know? And I'm the kind of friend that I'm totally open to it. Like, if I lay my cards on the table and they say, well, let me tell you what I feel like as you as a friend, I'm like, hey, let me know how I can improve as a friend and be the, because I want to be the best friend possible, right? And so, you know, and I haven't really had to set limits and boundaries with a friend. It's been like a really long time. And so I, I haven't really had to set limits and boundaries with people in my life, you know, maybe here and there, but like not where it's like kept me awake at night for days on end that I didn't know what to do about it in a certain given situation. Um, but I think that that has been a huge issue for me in the past. And I think it's a huge, it's got to be a huge issue for a lot of people is the reason we don't set limits and boundaries, especially with family members, because one of the biggest questions I get is, Peter, you talk a lot about setting limits and boundaries, but how do you do that when it's a family member? How do you do that when it's your mom, right? Well, I mean, there are people that set limits and boundaries with their family. I was just talking about that on my drama channel today, and they just don't talk. They have no communication, there's no interaction and whatever. And that makes me sad, right? Like that really makes me sad. But maybe the person that you are wanting to have this relationship with or trying to, and you haven't set limits and boundaries because you feel bad for them or whatever, maybe they are not in a state of mind where they can come up to the level of being the person that you need to be in your life. And that's where it's, you have to start setting limits and boundaries. And that doesn't necessarily look, you know, like, just not ever talking to that person again or seeing them. You know, I like have had so many like friends that are spouses or partners of people that are in recovery, obviously, you know, cause I've been sober for 27 years that I meet people's partners through the years and whatever. And people that will go in and out, get sober or go back out, get sober, whatever. And like one of the questions they'll ask me is like when I, the, the spouse or the boyfriend or girlfriend, when I set a limit, do I have to say the next time you drink or the next time you drug, I'm gone? And I'm like, if that's how you feel, you should say it, but don't say it unless you mean it. Because if you can't follow through with it, those words mean nothing. And they're like, well, what do you say? And I'm like, you don't have to leave. There's nothing that says that if that person continues to use, you have to leave. But what you can say is, I'm gonna make some rules for me to live with. I'm not gonna have alcohol in my house because it makes me uncomfortable when you drink here or no drugs or whatever. Or if you're intoxicated, you're not coming to a family event and you're, you know, I mean, you can set limits and boundaries and still live with that person because maybe you as a spouse or as a family member are not prepared to do that final uh, boundary, which is I'm done, I'm out of your life, okay? Now, I had a lot of people when I was actively using that, they were, easily put me out of their life. There were a lot of people that they couldn't do that, you know? So I think it just depends on where we're at. But I think setting boundaries and limits sometimes are so difficult because we don't want to hurt the feelings of the other person. And ultimately what that is, is emotional manipulation. That is the other person emotionally manipulating us because if they know that we're going to feel bad and they guilt trip us or they, you know, make us feel like, you know, like, oh, poor, is me, poor me, that it's poor me, poor me, poor another drink kind of thing, even if it's not an alcoholic, if they make us, if they emotionally manipulate us into feeling bad, then we're not gonna set a boundary or a limit because we don't want them upset. We don't wanna hurt their feelings, you know? And that's where you have to be able to get to the point where you're like, my life is important. My feelings are important. My emotions are important, okay? And I am really worn out and I am really tired. Have you ever just been around one person that when you're done being around them, you're exhausted? 
that is a person that is emotionally just like draining you of all of your energy and they are toxic to your life, okay? I'm not talking about a person that you like run around with and go shopping and go to lunch and you have so much fun that when you get home you want to nap. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the person that from the moment that you get into the car until the moment that you are back home, okay, it is just nonstop about how miserable their life is and you wouldn't understand and on it. And we've all had somebody like that in our life, right? That's a, that's a really good example of somebody that we probably need. I would need to set boundaries and limits for, right? But it's hard. Because those are the people that we feel the sorriest for, right? And we don't want to hurt somebody's feelings that we feel sorry for. So we don't. We don't end up setting limits and boundaries for them, you know? And then we're the ones that end up suffering the longest and the most, I think. And then what's funny is, <laughs> this is something I have learned in my life, right? That I have gone to bat for some of these people and I have been there for them and I have done everything possible and knowing in my head, like, and sitting there at times being like, I just wish I just wasn't even part of this. You know, I wish we were not even like <laughs> friends or what I, I'm like, even afraid to say it, you know, but it's like where I thought like, God, this is just so draining, you know? And then it's like, all of a sudden, six months later, I'm like, I haven't heard from this person for a while. And then it's like, they like left me as a friend and I'm like, oh my God, maybe I'm the toxic one. No, but you know what I mean? It's because what they're not, what it, what's happening is at some point they're not getting what they need from us anymore, right? And so they go into the next person and the next person and the next person. If you have parents that are like, that are completely toxic, because I've heard this from so many friends of mine, what they'll do is they'll go from sibling to sibling to sibling. And when one sibling, like they drain them of their energy and they take, you know, take emotionally all they can from them, they'll go to the next sibling and the next sibling. And if you knew how tough my life was, and if you knew how hard my life was, you wouldn't be doing this to me and whatever. And it just kind of goes in this cycle, you know? All right, let's um, open the language of letting go. I started by saying, if you're going to buy Codependent No More, also buy the language of letting go. It's the sister book to it. And it's absolutely fantastic. Okay, June 22nd. <laughs> oh my God, you guys, it's three pages long. <laughs> we're, we ain't reading all that today. Okay, um, let's see the other book, which is Journey to the Heart, which is Melody Beatty's other book that I love. If it's long too, then I'm just going to wrap this up. <laughs> okay, forgive your inner child for being so afraid. No matter how much work we've done on ourselves, no matter how committed we are to healing, there may be part of us that's four years old when we deal with certain people. There may be a part of, this is kind of what I'm talking about a little bit. There may be part of us that still feels frozen, frightened, powerless, and abandoned when we face certain situations. We may all be dressed up, we may be all dressed up, look grown up, have our professional hat on, but the person wearing it is four and scared, afraid to speak up, relax, be who we are, a powerful, sensitive, creative, competent, intelligent, wise adult. Watch for these four-year-olds. Be gentle, kind, compassionate, forgive them for being so frightened. They have reasons that are valid, understandable, and sometimes noble, but their reasons come from a long time ago. This is now. We're grown now, we're strong, we're free. We can walk away, speak up, laugh, so, laugh say how we feel, and we can't be abandoned anymore because we know how to live on our own. Watch for your four-year-old. This child may never completely leave you, but you don't have to let him or her run the show. It's so interesting, you know. Um, I guess this really wasn't what I was just talking about, but there have been moments in my life where like when I'm talking about my past, like I was just doing a video on my Peter Dusto channel not too long ago, and I was talking about being bullied. Like, I literally can see that kid at six, eight, Peter, you know, six, but, but like it's not me. Like it's somebody else that I'm looking back on that life. And I was like, I can almost kind of like it was outside of me and I was real protective of that kid to some degree, but couldn't be protective of enough, you know? But I can see him at like six sitting at that lunch table or eight, you know? When the kids were like tripping him in the hall and calling him names or 10, you know? Or walking down to school, you know, in junior high and nobody saying anything to him. and high school, you know, being pushed into lockers and downstairs and stuff like that. And, and I see that kid and I just kind of want to give him a hug, you know, and be like, I know that things are crap now, but if you can make it out of this alive, you're going to be okay. I don't know that I would have believed it, honestly, if anybody had said that to me. Um, I sometimes ask myself, you know, like, looking back on all of that because you know there was so much more to it too I mean I was you know my mom was an active alcoholic and that was really really scary to me um and I remember that as long as I can you know go back in my time but 
I think there was so much that when I go back to that kid, what I, the two things I realize is, number one, that that kid at any age felt very, very alone. And I've always kind of had that feeling in my life, my entire life, like I'm, I'm in this alone. And the second thing is, I don't know where I learned this from a young age, but I did. And this is where I feel like some strength came from the things that I went through was just to put one foot in front of the other, just to put one day in front of the other. So like when I got sober, that concept of one day at a time was not a tough concept for me because I had lived that being bullied for years and years and years. That idea of just put one foot in front of the other and just try to like make it or fake it till you make it, like I did that for years at a time, it just wasn't about substances, you know? And so I look back on that kid and that kid that was just trying to put on a brave face, you know? Um, I remember reading, a couple years ago, he's one of my favorite young adult fiction authors, and his name's Sean David Hutchinson. He's probably five or ten years younger than me. And he wrote a memoir, and it was called Brave Face. And I loved that title because I thought, God, that's so true. You know, I mean, we've heard that saying before, put on a brave face. But I really did. Like, I put on a brave face on a regular basis and just like, I'm okay, I'm fine, I'm okay, I'm, I'm fine, when I wasn't, you know? And maybe that got me, you know, through it all. I don't know, but... To be very, very sensitive and gentle to those children of, that we once were that are still there, you know, inside of all of us. Because um, I think that many of us have not been kind to those, you know. So anyway, let me know what you think about all of that in the comment section below. I love you guys, and I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.